Um, a Sunday school teacher just finished a, a lesson about heaven and then asked her students, how many of you want to go to heaven? And of course, you know, everybody in the class raised their hands except for one little boy. And the teacher said, William, don't you want to go to heaven someday? And suddenly he, he kind of lit up a little bit and said, oh yes, ma'am, someday. I just thought you were taking up a load right now. <laughs> uh, we all want to go to heaven, I think, someday. And we're also very curious about what it's going to be like when we get there. You know, someone once posed uh, the question, what is heaven like to another group of Sunday school's kids? And I, I liked a couple of the answers. Scott, age eight, replied, heaven is up in the sky and you can look down on circuses for free if you want to, but you have to ask God for permission first. And then uh, David, age seven, said, heaven is kind of big and they go around playing harps all the time. I don't know how to play a harp but I guess I better learn how to play that dumb old thing someday. <laughs> In one of his Far Side cartoons, Gary Larson depicts a winged man seated, uh, s sitting on a cloud in heaven with nobody nearby and, and nothing to do. And, and he's just marooned on this celestial post. And the caption witnesses his despair. It says, I wish I'd brought a magazine. And that's how uh, a lot of us, I'm afraid, envision heaven. That's how we picture heaven. You know, clouds in our midst, harps on our laps, and time on our hands. Endless, endless time. Non-stop sing-alongs or you know, a hymn and then a chorus and then still more verses. Uh, but is this really what heaven is going to be like? In the last couple of weeks, we've explored what lies beyond death's door. And, and the Bible portrays three different realms that we can and some of us will experience on the other side of eternity. One is Hades, and we talked about that two weeks ago. Hades is the, the place of the dead or this, this realm where disembodied spirits go to wait for the resurrection when Christ comes again and the dead are raised and we get reunited with, with our bodies. And then we talked last week about hell. And by the way, my my sermon on hell last Sunday, it seems, stirred quite a bit of conversation and, uh, and questions, and maybe even a little bit of controversy, which I think is, is good and healthy. And, and I'm glad to hear that because you know, it's important for us as Christians committed to God's Word to review the things that we believe from time to time and to compare them to Scripture and see if they stack up and, and they measure up to, to what the Bible actually says. And, uh, and so, uh, I met with our elders earlier this week and we decided that this topic is kind of big and it needs a little bit more discussion and development. And so what we're going to do in, here in a, a couple of weeks, two weeks from today, we're going to have a joint Sunday school class. We're going to have both adult classes come together and even the teenagers are invited to join us. And we're going to discuss and develop that a little bit further. And, you know, if, if you're interested in this idea of hell and what it's like, then uh, I want to encourage you to be there. You can you know, share uh, your questions or, or if you've got an opinion that you want to share or a scripture that you think needs to be injected into the conversation, then that's an opportunity for you to do that. And we can kind of weigh these different views and see uh, what we think about them and, and develop them and compare them to scripture to see what the Bible says. So, so if you're interested in that topic, please be back here again in two weeks, and we'll follow up and do a little bit more digging into the subject of hell. Um, but for today, I don't want to talk any more about hell. I want to talk to you about heaven. And according to a Gallup poll conducted f by a U.S. News and World Report, um, as many as 81% of Americans believe that heaven exists, and as many as 78% believe they have a good or excellent chance of getting in. That number surprised me a little bit. But, uh, but few know what to expect when they get there. And I think the success of, of these books about near-death experiences, such as Heaven is for Real and 90 Minutes in Heaven and all these others, uh, indicate, they, they reveal this innate longing to know what lies beyond Heaven's gates. But rather than relying on those notoriously unreliable experiences, Christians ought to find our answers in Scripture. And one of the most vivid, expressive descriptions of heaven 
is found in Revelation 21. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open it up. It's, it's the second to last chapter of the Bible, so it shouldn't take too long to find. you just got to skip through the concordance and the maps in the back. But, uh, but Revelation 21 begins with these words in verse 1. It says, this is John speaking, by the way, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a, beautiful, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. and He will live with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them. And He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain all these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. As with the rest of this apocalyptic book, this passage is replete with you know, fantasy imagery and symbolism. And so we can't always take everything we read in Revelation too literally. But I do believe that this passage paints a picture that gives us a glimpse of heaven's glory. And it, it highlights three important features that will, be, that will make heaven so very heavenly for us. First, this passage reminds us that heaven will be real. The movies have, have told you wrong. You know, those images of the knee-high knee fog banks and disembodied friends and floating spirits. I mean, forget those things. Unlike the immaterial realm of Hades, Heaven will be as real as the soil in your garden, as solid as, as the pew beneath your bottom. You know, when Christ comes, he, he will resurrect. Everybody will be resurrected from the dead and, and our spirits will be united with new bodies, bodies that he describes as being glorious and imperishable and immortal. And these new bodies will be flesh and blood bodies, not too different from the ones we have now. And so we'll need a real physical place to live and the present heavens and the present earth will disappear we read Peter's description of that uh, last Sunday but that's not the end of the story because God says here in, in verse 5 look I am making everything new he will purge he will cleanse and then he will reconstruct his cosmos centuries before John's vision God told Isaiah in Isaiah 65 Verse 17 through 18, Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad. Rejoice forever in my creation. Rejoice forever in it. John's description of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of, out of heaven from God and coming down to earth symbolizes the merging of these two realms. Uh, at that time, heaven and earth will be joined together. And it shouldn't be too difficult, I think, for Christians to imagine a world where heaven and earth are actually one. I mean, after all, we have the perfect analogy in Jesus himself. You know, God and man will be forever united in the person of Jesus Christ. And when Christ comes again, heaven and earth will be forever united in this new universe that God creates. God's plan is to abolish the gulf between the physical world and the spiritual world. There will be no more divided realms. It will just be one cosmos, one universe, united under one Lord forever. And John describes this new heaven, this new earth, as a place that will have trees and rivers and cities and buildings and gates and streets and mountains and houses. All of this is in Revelation 21 and 22. It will be a, a place of sensory delight and breathtaking beauty. But nothing compares to the crowning jewel, that, that city, the new Jerusalem. Christ will descend, he says, in a city unlike any other the earth has ever seen, with these shimmering spires and jewel-encrusted buildings and streets made of purest gold. And of course, again, there's a, a great deal of symbolism here. You know, we shouldn't expect the streets of heaven to be literally paved with gold or that the walls will actually be gilded with every type of jewel. In fact, the, the actual material substance 
will probably be unlike anything we've ever seen or touched. You know, there may very well be whole new chemical combinations that we've never even imagined. And yet, these metaphors communicate how beautiful and how amazing this heavenly city will be. And it's not just beautiful, it's also very, very big. Large enough to contain all of the land mass from the Appalachians to the California coast, from Canada to Mexico. John describes it as a square of exactly 12,000 stadia. 12,000 stadia, that was their unit of measure. Uh, it roughly translates into 1,400 miles. And, and this, this massive city is 40 times the size of England, 10 times the size of France, and, and larger than India, and that's just the ground floor. And again, the actual measurements are likely metaphors. 12,000. 12 is the number for God's people, like 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And, and 1,000 is the number for totality, you know, like in the Psalms where it says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, he doesn't own the cattle on just a thousand. He owns the cattle on all the hills. And so the point is that Jesus is preparing a place for us that has ample space, room for all of God's people from every generation in every epoch of time. And after hearing all these majestic metaphors and colorful comparisons, I, I think we tend to... To, to get to where we're like, you know, hey, John, why don't you just tell us exactly what it's like instead of just using all these colorful images and stuff like that? A little girl named Mary once asked a similar question. Years ago, a beautiful baby girl was born to a Christian couple. And after several weeks, they, they noticed that she seemed to be having trouble with her vision. They scheduled an appointment, and the ophthalmologist told them, your daughter Mary is rapidly losing her sight. And she'll likely be blind before her first birthday. But it's possible that when she turns 12, at around that age when she's developed enough, that an operation could be done to restore her sight. And so for 12 years, Mary learned to live in the dark. And she and her parents adapted quite well. Uh, and together they overcame Mary's many obstacles that she faced in life. But they still anxiously awaited the day that Mary's eyes could be opened. And finally that day arrived and Mary's family traveled to a hospital in the Alps where the corrective surgery was performed. Mary's bandages were removed just as the sun was setting behind the majestic peaks outside her window. And it was against that backdrop that she saw her mom and dad for the very first time. And while tears streamed down her cheeks, she asked, Mom, why didn't you tell me that the world is so beautiful? And her mom just gathered her up in her arms and she said, I tried to tell you, Mary, but I just didn't have the words. I just didn't have the words. Words fall short, don't they? If, if the human tongue is inadequate to describe the, the beauty and grandeur of this world to someone who's never seen it, how much more so the next? And consequently, John just stumbled into the storage closet of metaphors and returns with an armload of word pictures. But regardless of what it actually looks like, it will truly be heaven on earth in the most literal sense. And that brings us to the second characteristic of heaven highlighted in John's vision. Furthermore, heaven is not only real, but it is righteous. John describes the, the New Jerusalem as the holy city descending from God. And that's exactly what heaven will be. Holy. You know, it, it will be good and perfect in every way. Peter, again, we, we saw last Sunday, he described it in verse 13 as, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. God's righteousness. Heaven will be the the home to all that is good and right. As Christians, we look forward to, to a day when all of creation, every square inch, is flooded with the love, peace, and joy of Jesus Christ. And when the coming of Christ will herald the total abolition of sin and suffering and sorrow. In fact, as, as John witnesses this melding of heaven and earth, he hears a, a loud voice cry out in verse 4, 
saying, God will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. One of the, the greatest blessings of heaven is what won't be there. You know, no death, disease, or divorce. No trials or tribulation or turmoil. No funeral home, homes or abortion clinics or psychiatric wards. No rape, no missing children, no drug rehab centers. No bigotry, no muggings, no killings. No worry, no depression, no economic downturns. No wars, no unemployment. Close friends, but no cliques. Laughter, but no put down. Intimacy with no temptation to immorality. No hidden agendas, no backroom deals, no betrayals. And without the presence of evil, the new heaven and earth will be uh, like nothing we've ever experienced. In this world that, that we live in now, bad moods affect even the, the best families. You know, complaints overshadow even the clearest days. Bad apples spoil bunches of us, but rotten fruit doesn't qualify for heaven's produce section. You know, Christ will have completely finished his redemptive work. All gossip will be excised. All jealousy will be extracted. He will suction every last drop of ugliness from the darkest corners of your soul. And since heaven is the, the home of righteousness and it's going to be your home and mine, then that means you and I will have to be made righteous too. And, and you will love the result. No one will doubt your word. No one will question your motives or speak evil about you behind your back. You will still be you but you'll be a better you, the you that you've always wanted to be. I've always liked what John MacArthur said about heaven. He said, heaven is the perfect place for people made perfect. And one thing is for sure, you will love it there. Never weary, never selfish, never defeated. Clear mind, tireless muscles, unhindered joy. Heaven is a perfect place for perfected people living with their perfect Lord. And that brings us to the last trait of heaven that John's vision highlights. Finally, heaven, he says, is relational. It's all about who you're with. In other words, eternal life will be heavenly because who we spend it with. From the, the throne of God, John hears this voice proclaim in verse 3, Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. The very best part of heaven will be getting to know God. What we've only seen in our thoughts we'll, we'll see with our eyes. And what we've struggled to imagine we'll be free to behold. And what we've seen in a glimpse we'll see in full view. Imagine finally being able to to wrap your mind around the concept of a God that exists in three persons and yet one nature. You know, this whole Father, Son, and Spirit thing. Or imagine exploring the, the depths of God's love and wisdom and holiness. Or imagine forever growing in our capacity to, to fathom His immensity and immutability and incomprehensibility. And to top it all off, the more that we come to know Him, the more there will be to know endless attributes await us. His grace will increasingly stun. Wisdom progressively astound and, and perfection even more sharpened into focus over time. We serve a God so wrapped with wonders that their viewing requires an eternity. A God who, whose beauty enhances with proximity. And never again will God feel distant. That's one of the things I think that that Christians struggle with the most in this life is that, that feeling that, that God's not right there with you all the time. He is. He's ever present. But we don't notice. We don't see it. We don't feel it. In heaven, your home will be His home. He'll be right there for you to see and touch and feel. And isn't that what Jesus promised? And before leaving this world, Jesus assures His disciples in John 14, 1-3. He says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in Me. There are many rooms in My Father's house. I would not tell you this if it were not true. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back 
and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. That's the promise. Take you to be with me so that we can be where Jesus is. And in the the words of Jesse B. Pounds, anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I'll be home sweet home. In C.S. Lewis's wonderful books, the, The Chronicles of Narnia, the characters who lived in Narnia have completed their time and their work there. And in the closing chapter, Aslan, the great lion who represents Jesus, has come for them in order to take them home. And they're headed away from Narnia into Aslan's country. And, and when they enter, they're greeted by these familiar scenes. And one of the characters cries out, saying, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, even though I never knew it until now. The reason we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Isn't that great? Friends, I think that we will all feel the same way when Christ comes to take us home. I don't know if Don Piper actually spent 90 minutes in heaven or if Colton Burpo really sat in Jesus' lap and asked the angels of heaven to sing, We Will Rock You. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when it comes to these near-death experiences, the, the line between dream and reality is often blurred and it's hard to tell the difference. But when it comes to Scripture, we can be certain and we can be clear. We can rely on God's Word to reveal to us what we could never otherwise know. And so, yes, heaven is real. Heaven is the home of righteousness. And heaven is, is a place all about relationship. About our relationship with God, our relationship with each other. A place where real people enjoy the love and fellowship of a real, righteous, and relational God. And I very much enjoyed this series on the afterlife. I hope that it has given you hope and encouragement but I also hope it challenged you. If you aren't sure whether you have a home awaiting you in heaven, then you need to get sure about that now. Now, if you don't know which path you're on, whether it's the, the road that leads to life or the road that leads to destruction, you need to choose a path. And if there's any way that I can help you with that, if I can help you to get your relationship with God to where it needs to be so that you can feel secure and sing, anywhere with Jesus, we home sweet home, then I want to invite you to come and talk with me while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.